To borrow from an old church term, if you have your Bibles with you, you used to say turn to page such and such or turn to Haggai. We're going to go to Haggai today. It used to be that you had to like try to pretend you weren't looking for it. You were like, oh yeah, I know right where that's at. I, I read Haggai all the time. I'll tell you, it's uh, to the right of Psalms, to the left of the New Testament, but now your new phones, you can just scroll down and find it. Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. We're going to start there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is a time for you yourselves. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have you your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in, the purse, in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I have called for a drought on the fields and the mountains and on the grain and the new wine and the olive oil and everything else the ground produces, the people and the livestock and all the labor of your hands. Um, if you're thinking like, ooh, that seems like kind of a depressing way to start church. <laughs> I know. There's an old Ray Wiley Hubbard song called The Messenger, and there's a line in it. Um, it's, it's not new, and he gives... He gives credit to the poet Rilke, and it turns out Rilke didn't say it this way. But here's the line in the song. It says, Now I have a mission and a small coat of honor to stand and deliver by whatever measure. And the message I give, this is the part, this is why I included it. The message I give you is by the old poet Rilke. He said, Our fears are like dragons guarding our most precious treasures. And he didn't say it exactly that way, but I've always, I've always thought that was an interesting thought, that the greatest things in our life are hidden or they're disguised by things that we're the most likely to avoid. And it seems like every philosopher, every deep thinker, every person who is brilliant and spend their time, spends their time milling over life and the meaning of life and the purpose of within life, the purpose in life and all these things, all these great thinkers, they disagree on almost everything. But one of the things that they all agree on is this, is that life has this way of deceiving people that are pursuing comfort. Life has this way of when you run from your fear and when you run towards comfort of pushing you in ways that are negative and that are bad. The saying is that the way up is to go down first and the shortest way home is the long way around. There's a thousand different ways of saying basically what Ray Wiley Hubbard is saying, which is that your fears are like dragons guarding your most valued treasures. I remember we were moving cows. This has been a few years ago and I've brought it up to him a lot since in in uh, conversation, but a few years ago, I went gathering cows out of the, the grazing allotment with Sean Santucci. And when they drop us off up there and they take off in the truck and we're supposed to just kind of make sure there's nothing up a couple of these draws. And we're coming home and they've got these just thick palmetto brush and you can't, you can't get through it and it just covers the hillside. And so you have to really be careful and like, oh, this is the way you're supposed to go. This isn't the way you're supposed to go. And and horses can't get through it. You get down in it. I mean, it's just, it, it's thick. It's like old videos of what you see in Vietnam where the brush is just thick. And so Sean, I'm following Sean. I don't have a clue. I mean, there's 10 bajillion acres up there. I don't have a clue on where we're supposed to be going. Sean's like, this is how we're supposed to go. So we take what seemed to be the right way. And we get halfway down. And I mean, it's, I mean, it's steep. You're on a horse and you're going down, you know, you're kind of leaning back. Horses are sort of shuffling around and it's not the kind of environment where you want to get stuck in brush. And have to turn around. And that is exactly what happened. We got down and we we're in this sort of this V. And it turns out that's not the way. It might have been the shortest distance, but it was not the fastest way. It was not the best way, even though it looked, it looked in the opening like, oh, that's got to work. We get down there. We have to turn around. We have to come back. And that happened a few times. By the time we finally got home, we felt like we had ridden for years. We finally found the right way home. And it turns out that the fastest way home was the longest way around. And I think... That, in a physical sense, is exactly what Rilke was trying to explain, what Ray Wiley Hubbard, when people like Jordan Peterson say that the, your greatest success is most likely found in the place you're, place you're least likely to want to look. These great thinkers that have this same exact concept that says, hey, 
when you're trying to take shortcuts, you're almost constantly finding yourself in these unintended consequences, consequences that you didn't mean, but you were just pursuing the wrong set of values. When you go to the Bible, there's this deep and wide thread, this theme that focuses on exactly this, this exact same concept. So if you're sitting here in church today, I got almost horrific, traumatic news. But if it's true, it's better that we hear it. It's news that you may not want to hear, but that if you hear it might positively affect the outcome of your life. I don't, in my own life, I don't want what's easiest. I don't want what makes me feel the best. I want the truth. I want the truth because at least I know what changes are necessary. It's like going to the doctor and the doctor says you have cancer and you go, that's terrible. But what would have been better not to know at all and just have it continue or to find out and take the necessary steps to address it, right? Sometimes the truth is difficult. I think that's what this theme is. I, I, I suspect this isn't the best feel good message I've ever preached. We are capable the Bible talks about, we're capable of feeling a certain way with absolute confidence while being wrong. <laughs> I know it's 2022 and we're told that how we feel is the ultimate truth. There is no truth more ultimate or more powerful than what we feel in the moment. And the Bible says, that's not how it works. I've said it before, but you hear about people who get frostbite. They're out and they start to to uh, hypothermia, they get hypothermia and they're cold. And in their weakened condition of hypothermia, they start to feel hot. And because they feel hot, they start taking clothes off. They say that, that when you discover people who have died from hypothermia, they've taken clothes off and you go, what do you do? They're take because what they feel is not aligning to what is true. We live in a culture that celebrates the behavior of people with hypothermia. We celebrate people pursuing their preferences. Well, what I want, well, what I like, well, what I prefer, what I think would be best. And we're like that, well, that's your truth. Truth is not universal. Truth is individual. We avoid pain. Pain is instantly bad. Conflict, not good at all. Fear, don't want anything that makes us fearful. We just want to move away from the things that we're afraid of. Rejection, uh, financial stress. Those are the sorts of things we're just good, getting away from them. And it sends us towards a life of far worse consequences. And yet, and yet, the Bible over and over and over and over and over, you get my point, and over and over and over again, describes the blessings and the purpose and the foundations of life that are found just on the other side of our logic. That sometimes the Bible brings us to a place where our logic says, that's the shortest way home. You don't know what's around the corner. I don't care what's around the corner. Logic tells me that's the fastest way to get where I want to go. And the Bible goes, well, on the other side of your logic, there's this whole different concept or grasp of life. I heard um, Marty Solomon say it this way, that so many times the Christians especially seem to be paralyzed by logic, paralyzed by that what God is doing doesn't align to what we feel or what we see or what we think. And so instead of trusting God and walking into pain or discomfort or stress or all these things that we try to avoid, instead of walking through that and seeing what God has on the other side, we see the dragons guarding it. We never find the treasure. One of the scariest verses for me in the Bible, first of all, is Lord, Lord, I did all these things for you. And he's like, yeah, I never knew that's in Matthew. That's, that's the scariest verse. Second, maybe scariest verse is Jeremiah 17, 9. Uh, it's in your Bibles, it's Old Testament. You, you get the idea. Verse nine says the heart. This isn't how it words it. It says the heart is deceitful above all things. But you know what it says? The heart lies to you. <laughs> so we live in a culture that says, follow your heart. And the Bible goes, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't want that. You don't follow your heart. Your heart lies to you. Your heart your emotion says, I'm in love and I feel this way or I prefer this or I like this. Have you ever, this is what sucks, is that sometimes you follow your preferences and it goes the way you wanted it to. You get everything that you wanted and you're not any happier. You're no better off. And what you found out was your preferences were flawed. Jeremiah's warning is like, your heart is above all things deceitful. Who can cure it? Who can understand it? You may think of yourself as an honest person. You might be an honest person. To the best of your knowledge, you may do the best you can to be honest in every situation. And the Bible is still like flashing this red light that goes, but beware, you are probably lying to yourself. 
you know my worst my le- just at a personal level my least favorite people who have never considered that maybe they're the villain they just they just can't get there they can't consider that maybe they're the bad guy that maybe they're judgmental that maybe their sin is just as bad as someone else's sin and so it's like the the heart is like no you're good you're doing great man just keep going don't be kind you don't have to be gracious those are the bad guys you're the good guy remember do what the good guy would do and the bible is saying like your heart will lie to you it will let you to believe things that are not true and pursue things that produce bad results hebrews 11 6 says this i mean we're just gonna we're just gonna get into it this is why i said this isn't gonna be a feel-good sermon this is a we have a cancer of the soul and hebrews 11 6 says without faith it's impossible to please god boy okay Okay, let's get it to it. Your heart will lie to you, and you cannot please God unless at some point you do something and go somewhere and act in a way that goes against your nature. That's what faith is. Faith is persisting in obedience through logic or fear or discomfort. So your heart will lie to you and tell you one thing, and then you have to go against that to find what God's doing. This is, this is why I have struggled as a pastor is so many people, not so many, not everyone, not everyone's this way, but there's a large swath of the American church that somehow has aligned God's word to their preference. This is how I like, well, this is what I prefer. Well, this is what I, I'm not being fed the way that I'd like to be fed. And who, who told you that what you wanted was right? Who told us that just because we want it, we're justified in having it the way that we wanted it? Who's to say that what we want matters at all? See, we don't just question the process. We need to also question the, d- the desire, the end result. Like if it goes this way, then that's going to happen. We go, but is that right? Is that what God's got? There goes all the solid footing. I might be lying to myself and I wouldn't even know it. I wouldn't even know. How do I know if I'm lying to myself before I can please God? I have to go against my own logic. Like this is upside down world. Left is right, right is left. Now I don't know how to, how to have confidence in anything. And it feels like desperation. I think of uh, Psalms 139 when, <laughs> when David writes, search me God and know my heart. He's going, please help me to understand me. I don't get it. I don't know what's right. You ever have days like this? You feel one way on Monday and by Wednesday you feel a completely different way. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know what, he, what is going on. And your heart's like, gotcha. This chapter of Haggai describes so well how I felt for so many years in my life. And I, I suspect, I suspect coming out of COVID and going into a crazy world, and we're probably headed into like a slowdown financially and all this stuff is going on. I suspect that when I read this, there's going to be people here that are like, that's it. That's exactly how I feel. That's exactly, that's what's going on in my life. Trying to get home in ways that seemed the best to me, getting halfway down the road and having to turn around and go back. I get this feeling. My life, I've spent a lot of years in my life like, this will work. No, it won't. And I think in my younger years, I think God almost had more tolerance of like, yeah, go figure it out. You're going you're gonna to get tired of doing this. You're going to get tired of getting halfway down the mountain into Palmetto's and having to come back. Eventually, you're just going to try it my way the first time. I think the more failures you have in your life, um, first of all, the easier it is to give up. But the second, second of all, the easier it is to trust that God's going to do something because what you're doing isn't working. Haggai 1, let's read it again. Verse 5. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. This is God. This is, this is the parent who loves their kid disturbing the plans of their children. This is God who loves us making sure that our plans fail. Do you know he did that? Do you know that God sometimes makes sure that your plans fail? We're told he's a God who makes sure our plans succeed. He's like, not always. Sometimes your plans are stupid. And I make sure they won't work. Listen, now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. Hmm. What was that? What was that, God? You said that I did a lot of work and I planted a lot and the harvest was bad. And he's like, "Uh uh-huh, that's what I'm saying. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never ever fill. You put your clothes on, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. I feel like I'm probably stepping on some real tender areas in people's lives right now because I think that seems like the nation that we're living in. We do all this and the result is just nothing. I put in all the work and it's just nothing. I can't figure out what it feels like to put water into the well and have it pump water back. I prime the well and it never starts. And God's going, I know. I'm telling you, I get it. And I'm telling you, it's not because you're doing it wrong. It's because what you're doing, I'm making sure it doesn't work. Can't be the only one who hears that and thinks, wait a minute. God's going, you know, you're capable of climbing a ladder 
only to get to the top and realize it was leaned against the wrong wall. It keeps going. Verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house. God's going, hey, let's make what I want more important. Let's make my way more important than your way. Hey, let's take the, the person opinion and put it below the God opinion instead of vice versa. Let's do my thing first. Let's go my way first. Do we forget that God does that sometimes? Do you sometimes forget that God's like, uh-uh, <laughs> no, you're not running the show. Sit down, be quiet. I'm daddy, you're not. <clears throat> so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. God goes, why? So that I can enjoy it because I'm God and it's what I want. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be a little. What you brought home, I blew away. Uh-oh, now he's full on letting it out of the bag. He's like, I'm the one doing it. I'm the reason. It's not just happening and I'm observing it. I'm causing it. What <laughs> you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because you have, <laughs> because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock and all the labor of your hands. <laughs> People bury themselves all the time on paths that society will celebrate. Money, success, power, fame, wealth. There's a thousand things that you can pursue that the world will celebrate that in the end produce nothing. And God has this loving way of just taking the wind out of your sails sometimes because it's not it's not what he's got for you. And you go, why isn't this working? He's going, because I'm making sure that it doesn't. People bury themselves <clears throat> on this work pile over here. Freedom, success, purpose, foundation. Of the, the good things that God's got are only found, ready? By setting down your own agenda, your own results, your own outcome man that's a big word like to set down your own outcome to just give up on your own desired outcome and to instead look to God and go you tell me what my outcome should be God's going that's where it's found by by replacing this approach with that approach not by throwing them together and hoping that God can come along for the ride literally replacing the way that you live your life with an ultimate higher power that knows better than you do. This is basic stuff. This is like Christianity 101 of like, wait a minute, I kind of forget sometimes that God is God and I'm not. And this is his commands and this is what he has said. And it doesn't matter if I agree or not. So many forms of recovery include the admission of a higher power. And why is that? It's some, ready for this? This is a one point sermon. Here's the one point, ready? Your life needs something that's more right than you. It's one point, so I want to repeat it because I want to make sure we don't miss it. Your life needs something that is more right than you are. So that when you reach a T or, or, or an intersection, you take a fork in the road and you go, I want to go right. There's something that exists that goes, but if you say left, I'll go that way instead. We've lost that in our churches. We've lost that in the gospel. We've lost that in our communities. There's like, there's nothing sacred. We think of like, Jesus is my buddy. Oh, it's my friend. He's my buddy. No, he's not. He's saying, I'm disrupting the success of your life because my voice is getting clouded in the thousands of other voices that you hold as sacred. My house, he's Haggai 1, 9. My house first, not yours. There's a story First Kings 18, that the prophets of Baal and Israel were getting all sorts of footholds and they're starting to lose the kingdom and Elijah sees what's happening and he's like, no, this is it. We've got to establish who's more right. We've got to establish who God is. And Baal was the God of rain and blessings and storms. Baal, they would pray to Baal and it gets weird. It gets weird, the Asherah poles and like the beliefs that they were buying into. And I mean, it gets super weird, but Baal specifically, Elijah said, it's not going to rain. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Uh, just this drought that's unbelievable. And he specifically is targeting the heart, the very heart of the power structure. Where's the power source? And he's going straight to where the, the big machine plugs into the wall. And he's saying, no, we're not going to have rain until I say so. It doesn't actually say in the Bible that, that God told him to say that. It just seems like God maybe backed him up on that. And so, no, three and a half years, no, 
And so they have this, this moment where he goes, let's figure this out. Let's figure out whose power is more right, yours or his. And I think that's kind of what I'm saying is in your life, you need to have this moment where you go, let's figure out, let's figure out where does my good come from? Where do my finances come from? Is it from my job? Is it from my work ethic? Is it from my diligence? Is it from my faithfulness? Or is it that I have those things because God gave them to me? And that if he were to move me, I can surrender these things knowing, knowing that God is the source anyway. Do you see how big this is? So many times we think, well, I've got to work harder because that's why I, I bring this home and it's not enough. So what's the answer? Do it more, work harder, stay longer, spend less time with my family. It's, it's like literally Haggai 1.9, God's going, no, I'm not going to let that work. You've got to let go of the power that that holds on you to see who I am and how that works instead. Okay, so they're on the top of the mountain. Prophets of Baal, they're dancing around and cutting themselves and being crazy, and he's making fun of them because according to this thought, winter was when uh, Baal would disappear with his lover, and it was this whole, I mean, there's just, it's this elaborate God worship thing that they had going on, and they're dancing around, and he's making fun of them, and so then it comes time for Elijah to set the altar up, and it says he sets 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Judah, and he sets all this stuff up, and then it says this, verse 33, he arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it onto the offering and on the wood. I've never really, that's never really stood out to me. It felt like just sort of like a flex of he's like, oh, there's going to be a fire, but first let's put water on it. But think about this. They were in a three and a half year drought. Specifically, the weakest part of their land was the water source. And he says, go to the water, wherever they found it, near the brook, go to the, go to the source of blessings. Let's go see, let's go take that water and apply it to this situation because God is not going to allow himself to be uh, co co competed against. Let's go, let's go. The God, of, the God of water and the God of storms. Let's just drench it. Let's just threaten the, the, the things that have stranglehold. Let's just threaten our finances. Let's just threaten our power. Let's just threaten our freedom and all these things that we're trying to create for ourselves. Let's just go right to it and put it on the altar and see what God does with it. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. For centuries, there have been power struggle, struggles in our cultures, different struggles with cultures and societies and things like that. In this one specifically, it was that they had given all this credit to the wrong source. In our culture, we give so much credit to work ethic or resources or finances or power. That's where we celebrate. And I think, I think if you're ever going to experience the power and the movement of God in your life, you have to look straight into the fear of failure in those areas and trust that the best thing that God's got for you is on the other side of those things. I'm in the middle of resigning from a job, moving into a new season that I don't know really fully what to expect and I'm already seeing a different part of God's nature because what I'm saying is I wanna put my family ahead of my job. As a dad, as a provider, there's a fear in that that goes like, oh, I don't know. I spent the last 10 years of my life making a point to try to build God's house the best that I knew how to do it. Not perfect. I mean, there's things I would have done different, but in a general sense. And it's like all of a sudden now, I'm getting to experience God moving me into something that's more personal. I'm getting to watch it. It's like I'm on a surfboard and I'm like, wait, what? We're going where? We're going to do what? So what I want to leave behind would be that thought that says, at some point, your heart is going to lie to you. You're going to have to move away from your pre preference. You're going to have to move into something you don't want. You're going to have to put your, because ultimately here's our culture. Here's our culture. We worship our preferences. It's the highest thing that we worship. We think that our preferences are as high as it gets on the sacred chart. Oh, that's going to cause me discomfort? Nope, I'm out. Oh, that's going to cause me stress? Nope, I'm out. Oh, that's going to put the power in somebody else? No, I'm out. We have so many ways that we defend our preference, and it's even come into our church. That's not what we want. That's not how we like it. We don't like that song. We don't like that sermon. We don't like that structure. And I think if, if I could leave something behind, it would be, I wonder, I wonder if, I wonder how life would look. If you took a dedicated season and go, okay, God, I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. I'm going to look at the rules. I'm going to study your word. I'm going to study what you say. I'm going to do that instead of what I want. I'm going to set down the worship of my preference. I'm going to take my preferences. I'm going to pour them on the altar and say, God, 
You know me better than I know myself. My heart lies to me all the time. My heart doesn't lie to you. You know me. That David moment says, you know me better than I know me. I'm putting that on the altar. Take me to somewhere I can't go on my own. Take me through my fears. Take me through my discomfort and show me who I am and what you created me to be. Take my outcomes. Take my desires. Take all of that. I wonder what your life would look like a year from now. I wonder what your life would look like a month from now. I think it goes back to Ezekiel 37 that says we begin in the inside we begin to move from death towards life and then we start to collectively tell a story of a group of people that have moved from death to life we start seeing people coming in we start bringing people in all of a sudden we start seeing people going what's going on what's happening there that's kind of what I'm so sick of my death I'm so sick of what I bring home gets blown away what I try I put money in my purse and it's gone and all these things are like yeah no that was me too that was my death I was living this life this exhausting life of death and when I set that down and I put it on the altar what I found is that what God had was better for me I didn't have to make as much money I didn't have to have as much influence I didn't have to have all the things I thought I had to have and what I found is my life is more fulfilling the way that God said to live it sometimes sometimes the fastest way home is the long way around sometimes the way up is down sometimes the reason that your house is struggling is because you've got to set it down and go build what God's told you to build. It's that Ray Wiley Hubbard song all over again. This says, inspect your fears because they're probably guarding some of the greatest treasures that God's got for your life. Let's pray. Lord, how do you tell a large swath of people they need to set down their preferences and go against what they want? (laughs) How in 2022 in America, when we're so preference driven, do you tell people that what you have is better than what they have? But God, that's what we're asking. Show us ways that you're going to change our lives for the better and show us who we are when we, when we press in to what you want instead of what we want. When we say there's a higher power that is more right than we are, show us what that can produce. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.